too long um, on that very subject. Yeah. Can I record it? Um, welcome to Radical Anthropology Group. Um, we're um, delighted to be having Matt Pope talking to us tonight. Matt is from the Institute of Archaeology um, at UCL. And um, he's um, an uh, archaeologist majorly associated with Western European Neanderthal sites, working at Boxgrove, working at Jersey, La Cotte, San Bernard, and all over um, Southeast England, as he's going to talk about. Um, Matt told us that he used to come to Radical Anthropology classes some time ago uh, when we were working in uh, Camden Community Centre. So it just shows that um, people go on to great things from uh, the nursery of RAG. So um, yeah, let's uh, hand over to Matt. Thank you very much, Camilla. Thanks for um, the invitation and uh, um, a return visit after a long time. As Camilla said, I'm very much um, uh, I'm very much an archaeologist in the sense that I'm a field archaeologist. Um, my original training was in um, early prehistoric stone artifacts, and I ended up needing to understand site formation processes in quite a lot of detail. And so, a lot of my actual uh, uh, later training and later experience was in how do we how do we reconstruct in the really fundamental nuts and bolts of stone artifacts, and if you're lucky, some butchered faunal remains. Um, complicated patterns of um, social interaction, cultural dynamics, cultural processes, ecology. Um, and the starting point for all of that is, is geology. It's, a, it's sedimentary processes. It's working out to what degree have these assemblages been modified? What kind of uh, time span are they represented by? Um, so what I'm going to try and do tonight is give you a really sort of personal take on my perception of Neanderthal archaeology as a field archaeologist who has really confined um, themselves to um, Northwest Europe for, for various reasons. I, I like it. It's, a, it's an interesting record. And as I, I'll show in the title, I find it a really exciting uh, location because it is always a frontier. Northwest Europe is a place that's always on the edge of any human adaptation because it's an area that regularly during the Pleistocene, during the last, well, the one, one million years plus of any kind of human occupation becomes regularly completely uninhabitable by any humans, not just by, by modern humans, but by you know, Neander Neanderthals and people who came before, like species like Homo heidelbergensis, maybe Homo antecessor. So you get these great resets. You get these great resets in which populations would have had to have gone either locally extinct, which I don't, I don't necessarily buy that that would have happened, more likely moved to more southerly latitudes, moved to places where the ecology, where the associated fauna, where the environment and temperatures could have sustained them, and then recolonized um, when temperatures changed after thousands of years. <clears throat> so you get this wonderful, what we call a biotidal zone, a place where if you're looking on, at it on long time scales, you're getting constant reoccupations. Now, Britain is perfect for that because uh, it's so marginal, it's actually depopulated for large parts of the last um, million years. I'm gonna be focusing this evening a bit more on um, a site that I work on in Jersey called La Cotte de saint Bernard, which um, has a slightly more extensive, but still interrupted um, population history. So I'm not going to go into loads of detail about the archaeological record itself, but I'm going to use it as a bit of a lens through which to talk about how I approach Neanderthal archaeology, uh, maybe open the way for us to have a bit of a discussion um, about um, Neanderthal archaeology afterwards as well. So let me just get the, the PowerPoint going. Um, I'm going to start with just you know, a very personal perspective on Neanderthal archaeology. Um, so this image here is, is really powerful for me because um, it appeared in, a, in an encyclopedia I had as a child. And um, I was completely skeleton phobic as a child. I couldn't, I couldn't look at skeletons. I couldn't think about skeletons. 
if there was a skeleton on the TV, I, I, it was just an, an, an irrational fear of skeletons. So my father actually had to cover this um, picture over with a piece of white paper and sellotape for me to go anywhere near the book because I like the rest of the encyclopedia. Um, you know, it turns out this and the other, the other skeletons on the same page that were, that were covered up and now very much kind of um, old friends to me. This is the, the um, La Chapelle um, au Saint um, skeleton. You know, this is um, now, you know, a, an example, a case study that I know really well, but, you know, still psychologically, when I, when I confront human remains, I still have a very visceral, re visceral reaction. Well, thankfully in Northern Europe, we have so few human remains. I've never had to be troubled by my phobia. Um, particularly, but at the end of the lecture, we'll talk about some human remains from um, the Cote de Saint Bernard, which which are which are interesting. But you know, it was deeply there in in in, in my psyche this kind of relationship to um, extinct humans uh, and and fossil fossil remains. Um, Neanderthals I re-engaged with um, at, at university, um, where you know I was you know, really studying more the history of, of, of the discipline and really became excited about and started writing about the way the Neanderthal fossils, once they'd been discovered and recognized in the 19th century, had to take the place of, uh, of, of, a, of a missing link because there was this exciting new um, conceptual framework for, for human evolution that had been set out without all of the, um, all of the, pieces, all of the bits of evidence. It's really exciting, you know, to, 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 to imagine such a massive conceptual leap, you know, that's so theoretical without that data. And we should be really quite forgiving of the way Neanderthal fossils were kind of slotted in, in the 19th century and the 20th century into this framework when there was so little, um, little other, other data. You know, even when it gets to like Marcel and um, Bull's, um, a reconstruction here on the right of that La Chapelle au Saint um, uh, individual um, with, you know, covered in hair, with a very simian face, with, with a hunched over aspect. You know, there is so much in here um, that, that's shoehorned in that doesn't come from the anatomy at all, came from no other, anat uh, no other evidence other than the need to fill that conceptual, conceptual framework. At that point in time as well, um, something else written about and worked about, uh, worked on, has been how the awareness of this evolutionary framework um, in popular culture started to populate the mind and imagination of people um, as well. And, and of course, this is something growing up in sort of mid 20th century popular culture, I couldn't escape from. Um, as, as a child either with, with, with Neanderthal people, early humans, missing links, playing this kind of role in, in popular culture um, and in, in our imagination of what it is to be human and the possibilities of, of different ways of, of, of being human. H.G. Wells, The Time Machine is, 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 is a brilliant example where uh, mm. you know, that evolutionary framework is conflated into a single imaginary science fiction um, setting um, of uh, you know, effectively three different stages of evolution um, in, in place at the same time. These imaginary evolutionary relationships you know, take a much darker turn as we know during the, um, during the 20th century. Um, and one thing that in Sussex I've had to, had to kind of uh, deal with and engage with, of course, has been um, Piltdown. You know, we've, we've got Boxgrove, you know, a, a really fantastic um, Paleolithic site in the county of Sussex. But before that, the most famous early human site in Sussex was Piltdown. Um, of course, the site of, it's not a hoax. Hoaxes are kind of like, a, I don't know, slightly, slightly trivial. This was a scientific fraud. This was a scientific fraud that derailed a discipline, certainly derailed the national discipline, you know, totally compromised people's careers, people's livelihoods. It was, it was, a, it was a crime um, built down. Um, and we're pretty happy that it was carried out by one individual, um, well, largely by one individual, Charles Dawson. Um, but 
it took place here. You know, you imagine the absolute audacity, the, the, the hubris to be able to create a scientific hoax <coughs> fraud that places this key pivotal missing link, which was very much needed by that time because um, Neanderthal archaeology itself was starting to be recognized as being, you know, quite quite progressive in, in, in some ways, quite quite modern in some ways. You had other human fossils emerging like Homo heidelbergensis, the Maui jaw. So then the need there was a need for um, a early human ancestor that retained some you know ape-like features but still had a large brain. And it seemed completely reasonable to create this hoax in Sussex, um, in um, just close to a golf course, um, in a in a sleepy sleepy river valley. But it it's needs to be seen through the, the eyes of um, English exceptionalism, national international competition, especially competition with Germany, which had create which had found the. Uh, Mao Mandible only a few years before, and um, a kind of a, a nationalist sense of, of identity starting to emerge from pride in the, the, the this fossil record that was being being developed. Also, by this time, by the by the first half of the twentieth century, enough understanding had emerged that extinction was seen as being a very real possibility for many, many of these um, early human lineages, that there wasn't just a single straight um, progression from ape to modern human, but the human family tree was branching, branching and diversifying, which of course raises all sorts of questions about the um, origin of so-called races, but it also raises the option in evolutionary history for extinction, an extinction that is somehow justified by an evolutionary trajectory, by perhaps not being adaptable enough, by not being able to adapt to changes. So um, when you're seeing these evolutionary dead ends in the, in the conception of evolution um, in the early part of the 20th century, that concept of extinction carries with it um, a lot of weight. And you see re-imaginings um, uh, of what Neanderthal physique, what Neanderthal, um, uh, uh, you know, facial structures are, are like. Um, these coming from uh, America in the in the 1930s. And here we don't have a, an ape man anymore. We don't have a kind of a missing link. We have a clearly a human, but a human that is hunched, that has an expression that's, you know, seems sort of blank, the, the, the facial setting, you know, the, the whole expression here suggests a human that is not up to the level of, of modern humans. It suggests, suggests something that is uh, slightly less than you know, perfectly adapted. Um, this is seen through the lens, the, the lens of understanding that Neanderthals probably went extinct. And so there needs to be an explanation for why they went extinct and why Homo sapiens didn't. And uh, that explanation in the 1930s um, was seen through a very a kind of eugenic, eugenicist kind of framework of, uh, of uh, logic, evolutionary logic playing out. So here's some other 1930s reconstructions. That poor teenage boy on the left there doesn't look um, particularly destined for you know, a long um, successful lineage. The, the in, inherent in these reconstructions is the demise of these um, individuals as a population. And we even have, you know, things that quite often appear in textbooks like Carlton S. Kuhn suggesting, you know, Neanderthal people were so similar to us that if you dress them as modern humans and put them, you know, dress them, shave them, put them on a, on a tube train, they would pass on the modern modern underground. These didn't come from a good place. These came from an inherently um, racist um, perspective of, uh, of human, human diversity um, being uh, a series of parallel branches 
not all those branches being equal. Come the other side of the Second World War, um, and we start to see other perspectives emerging. You had to go through the Second World War before, before um, this, this, this happened, and you had to go through the horrors of the Second World War. But here um, is a much more optimistic um, um, view of human evolution with, um, yes, still, um, uh, um, you know, completely by today's standards, unacceptable separation um, of, of the human population, but at least degrees of interconnectivity and the idea that, um, you know, the extinction isn't inherent in that evolutionary journey. And we see more, um, if you like, optimistic reconstructions of Neanderthal um, life, still, you know, incredibly gendered, still incredibly cliched, um, but there is usually thought here, there's communication, there's awareness, because these are not populations that went extinct. These are populations that eventually, by the paradigm at that point in the post-war period, fed into modern human evolution, fed into the, the, the present day. And so you can try and track, if you look in these reconstruction draw, drawings, those glimmers of kind of humanity and uh, and creativity and uh, an awareness and forward thinking. I like this uh, this this individual here at the um, at the top. This is a Czech um, recon reconstruction of a Neanderthal group, and uh, yeah, you know, even even though this this guy is very separate and apart, that he's looking out. He's looking beyond um, um, the, the 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 cave. He's looking to a future that he's invested in and he will actually play a part on. He's not like those other Neanderthals that are just facing down that we saw earlier. Um, the iconic, you know, march, march of progress, um, which, you know, ended up with the entire course of human evolution, ending up in a white bearded dude who looks a bit like Charlton Heston there at the end. Um, you know, th this was still a transformative um, image, even though you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, inherently wrong in so many ways because it suggests that Neanderthal, here's the Neanderthal stage here, is feeding in to um, where modern humans, you know, end, where ended up feeding into the development of Homo sapiens. And I think the high point is really by the time you get into the late 1970s and 1980s, where not only are Neanderthals seen as contributing to um to the homo sapien lineage but the archaeology has kind of caught up the archaeology has caught up and it's become far more than just a typological um exercise far more than just kind of classifying different tool types based on morphology there's a lot more understanding about how um the toolkits associated with the Amtel archaeology the middle paleolithic how they might be used um, just how complex approaches to butchery, to, uh, to animal skin processing are, how much organization there is in Neanderthal life, uh, organized hunting, selective hunting of particular species, particular um, demographics within species. Um, so much so that um, the cognitive capabilities of Neanderthal populations are really starting to be um, recognized. And this is one of my favorite reconstruction drawings um, coming from the late 1970s. Um, and we have a Neanderthal group here who is you know, so fully kind of modern in, in, in the presentation here. And you know, the most exciting thing is <laughs> they appear to be talking um, and this is before any anatomical evidence being found that could really prove that Neanderthals had language, but they could be conceived to have language because how can you make a plan? How can you have a multi-stage way of making tools that requires a grammar, if you like, in terms of operation? How can you bring together concepts like a, a, a spear tip and a haft and a binding without a kind of conceptual framework that had a language? 
And so we have them communicating here. The fact that the most dominant figure in this Neanderthal reconstruction is a female, and it's a female who's talking with a plan and holding the attention of, um, you know, pretty much the rest of the group, um, you know, are the one, you know, wonderful innovative things that we started to see in the portrayal of Neanderthals and prehistoric people full stop at this point in time. All of this came to a bit of a crashing halt with the um, uh, discovery through my mitochondrial DNA evidence that there didn't seem to really be any contribution of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA into modern Homo sapien populations. Um, and this is really where I entered um, the discipline as an undergraduate. Um, on the other side of the um, discovery of the mitochondrial Eve population from which all Homo sapiens um, had, had apparently um, arisen um, and um, no evidence from this new uh, uh, this new way of looking at human populations that um, the Neanderthals had contributed anything. And this is a real paradigm shift um, over how everything had been progressing for really the previous 40, 40 years. Um, and so through the 90s, you can see there's lots of different sort of grapplings with what do we do with this Neanderthal population now? You know, we it had become conceptually so close to Homo sapiens, it had become, you know, on, on a par as a, as, a, as a human population. And yet it appeared that when uh, modern humans, Homo sapiens, had, had left Africa and dispersed across um, the rest of the old world. Every time they'd found other populations, they must have replaced them completely. And those replacement episodes may not have been, you know, particularly, um, you know, particularly peaceful um, to see such a complete replacement. So what did we do? What, we, what happened then? And for a while, Neanderthal populations existed in a bit of a, of a limbo. Um, state. They were obviously clearly human, but they had suffered the fate of extinction. And yet we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't recourse to the early 20th century way of thinking about extinction, which was, you know, that they weren't adapted because they'd been around for 400,000 years. And we knew by that time that they'd, they'd evolved in Eurasia, they'd um, adapted to a range of different climate regimes from, you know, really quite cold boreal conditions and never Arctic or completely in you know, the cold adapted, but, you know, really cool conditions, fully Mediterranean conditions, deciduous woodland, Atlantic coastline, the mammoth steppe, the, you know, mountainous areas of, of, of Central Asia, the Near East and all the different environmental um, uh, conditions um, uh, in over 400,000 years. They only disappear when modern humans um, arrive, you know, within a you know, 10 to 20,000 year overlap periods when modern humans arrive. And for most, um, most specialists, including me, that just was too much of a coincidence. The arrival of Homo sapiens in Eurasia and the fact that we couldn't find that mitochondrial DNA evidence um, suggested, you know, complete replacement. Outcompeted, marginalized, maybe in places, you know, there'd, there'd been violent conflict, although, you know, found no archeological evidence of that. Whatever you were seeing, you were seeing a replacement. And I think it led to, um, a, you know, an, an understanding of a ne Neanderthal populations as being equal to Homo sapiens but effectively falling foul on them. That effectively there was this, you know, colonization event that led to their um, eradication. And I think they were seen, you know, very much through that lens and to a degree um, today, you know, it's the, the, you know, we still haven't fully cleared up what actually happened during that period. Although we now know that the um, disappearance of Neanderthals was not quite so absolute. And this is still new relatively you know this is still you know just over a decade old that actually when you look beyond that mitochondrial dna it is there in the in the nuclear dna neanderthals and modern humans were sharing genetic material we now have a concept of um neanderthal populations um as you know being genetically linked and part of our um 
part of our genetic inheritance. If you come from, you know, outside um, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, there's a good chance, you know, you've got a, you have some degree of Neanderthal um, uh, lineage in, in your in your DNA. Um, and increasingly it's being found in sub-Saharan Africa as well. So we're left at a point now where I find it really difficult to talk about, um, you know, Neanderthal populations and our populations because I'm not a geneticist at all. I don't even deal in the anatomy. I rarely get to think about population levels, but I do regularly talk about Neanderthal behavior. I talk about Neanderthal culture. I talk about Neanderthal adaptation. Um, I try to be as clear as I can in language and try to be really precise in what I'm talking about. I don't like to, although sometimes you, know, you trip up, I don't like to say the Neanderthals or the Neanderthal this, you know, um, because I think even just sticking that word the in front of Neanderthal is, is, is difficult and it creates a barrier and it's instantly, instantly othering. Um, I also um, like to be really quite specific when I can in talking not about Neanderthals. I talk about Neanderthal culture, Neanderthal technology, Neanderthal adaptation, Neanderthal demographics, Neanderthal subsistence. And basically what I'm doing there is talking about probably a range of populations across a very large geographical area, across a very large period of time. And you're effectively dealing with a human population that spans Central Asia to Gibraltar, to, to, to Wales and further north for 400,000 years in all of these different climate regimes, all of these different ecological regimes with an evolutionary arc of their own. It is consequently impossible <laughs> to say anything about Neanderthal populations that is true across that huge arc of space and time. Um, so we're left with the challenge of, you know, trying to describe, you know, what's obviously, you know, a, a population level phenomena, um, obviously distinctive population in terms of their anatomy to contemporary populations in Europe. There are ar archaics like Homo heidelbergensis, if you want to recognize Homo heidelbergensis as another species, but uh, these slightly fatter, uh, flatter faced, um, uh, you know, large brow ridges, you know, relatively large brain cases, possibly slightly taller, possibly um, relatively um, more gracile, who knows? Um, they're, they're there um, as well. And then um, Homo sapiens, which may be coming into um, the very extremes of southeastern Europe as long as 200,000 years ago, or certainly um, in northern Africa by um, 300,000 years ago. So everything, you know, has, has its... <laughs> It's it's uh, it's correlated with it, you know, that you're, you're you want to identify a population, but then you've got to caveat where you're talking about that population in terms of time and talking about it in terms of space. And the biggest thing I have trouble with, and it's the last you know personal thing, is when we talk about us and who we are, because we talk about Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, but. Homo sapiens today are a population that have gone through changes, populations that in part interacted with Neanderthal populations, with Denisovans, maybe with others. We were transformed by those interactions, not just um, genetically, though that's really important, but also potentially behaviorally um, and culturally. We are a product of all of those um, interactions. And the fact that we look around us now and we see there's only one species on the planet. Um, and when I looked at that through the lens of um, extinction in the 90s, there was something quite horrifying about that. But now we know that that complete replacement did not happen, that there was absorption, that there was assimilation now, when you look, um, you know, I do think there is something, you know, really exciting about the fact that Homo sapiens today are the product of, you know, that, you know, that embracing and sharing um, and integrating 
of, of, of other populations. Even though there's probably lots of space for lots of very negative interactions, I think who we are and our identity today um, is something really exciting when seen through that evolutionary um, lens. So that's kind of the bigger picture. We can talk about that all a bit more, but don't ask me to go and talk about the genetics because I'm absolutely not a geneticist. I'm, I'm very much, you know, a, a, a spectator on the sidelines of the exciting things that are happening in genetics. <coughs> so um, for the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk about my very small part of looking at Neanderthal archaeology, Neanderthal adaptation um, in a little corner of northwest Europe um, in the Channel Islands. I'm just leaving you with the Kennis brothers reconstruction of a Neanderthal. We like the Kennis brothers at the moment very much, I think, of, of, of this decade. They are reconstruction drawings that maybe capture the zeitgeist of, of how we think about humans now. I want to know how people will look at the Kennis brothers in 20 years in 30 years, you know, what will, you know, what, you know, how will people criticize it? But the things I see with the Kenneth brothers are, you know, these are, you know, clearly distinct to the range of variation that we can see within um, modern Homo sapiens today. There's something distinctive about their anatomy, about their, 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 their facial structure, which is, you know, of course, Neanderthals are beyond you know, the range of anything that we, we, we see today, but they are clearly human. Their eyes have, um, you know, human awareness, human humor, you know, and, um, you know, it gives us an experience of extending the range of human possibilities by imagining um, these populations as, as, as being real and being present today. Um, and I like the playfulness that there is with, with Kenneth Brothers reconstructions. They don't take themselves too seriously. Um, and of course they do um, reference, um, yeah, modern culture, um, like uh, this apparently has um, hints of Sean Connery's Face worked into it. I don't know if that's true, but it was done for a it was done for uh, for a British museum, so maybe that is true. Okay, so this is the corner of the world that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this evening. This is the island of Jersey in the Channel Islands, where we focused um, a lot of our research for the last um, eleven years now. Um, here, here is the little. <laughs> island of Jersey and the reason that we're quite excited about it and the reason we originally went there was because sorry I'll get on to that in a minute but because it provides us a snapshot of um of human behavior at various different periods in time on the other side of the English Channel the English Channel at the moment you know being a high sea level um period is um a relatively impenetrable barrier for, for early prehistoric people. We don't think North European Neanderthal people had boats at all. So during any one period, you've got a barrier there. During even cold periods when the sea level is low, you have a massive river running down the center of the, of the English Channel. So you haven't got any um, easy contact across. Um, this is one of the reasons why we think the British record is so punctuated and so relatively sparse compared to Northern Europe. But what we wanted to do is look at the nearest part of the continent to us. And the Lacotte site provides a really good long sequence that shows us environmental change and behavioral change over the last 250, 270,000 years. Um, it also provided a way that we could interact with and begin a dialogue with um, our French counterparts working on the pre prehistoric archaeology of northern France to try and create a, an integrated um, early prehistory for what we call the La Manche region, La Manche being the, the, the French name for the English Channel. And we talk about times during so low sea level of La Manche land, like Doggerland, which is the, the, the low sea level North Sea. We're talking about the low sea level um, English Channel region. And we've had a wonderful 11 years working on La Cotte, working on a number of um, other sites on the island, discovering new sites um, with, a, with a great multidisciplinary team of, of uh, colleagues from Manchester, 
University, the British Museum, Natural History Museum, University of Newcastle, University of Wales, Trinity, St David's and uh, and uh, yeah had a real good commitment to publishing as well and also to media engagement and one of the lovely things about Neanderthal archaeology in, in the Channel Islands it, is it comes with a great backdrop um, there's plenty of sites in southern Britain we could take TV crews to. Most of them have been built on or they're quarries or they're a, you know, a, a residential area of um, South London or something. Not particularly cinematic, whereas we have some really beautiful, stunning coastlines. And it's a place where you can transport people out of the present, out of themselves um, into, into the past. So it's had some good media coverage. So I'm just going to go through some of the um, different aspects of the project and the windows that it's thrown on on Neanderthal behavior um, and Neanderthal um, archaeology. Um, first of all, you know, we, we rediscovered Lacotte, the St. Bernard's potential um, in the sense that it had been a site that had been mothballed for, for getting on for 35 years. No one had done any work there. Most people had thought it had been completely worked out. But within the first couple of years, we managed to get there. We'd managed to redate parts of the site. We'd managed to work out that actually a large part of this site spanned the point in time, 80,000 years, 47,000 years. We go up to around you know 20,000 years in the higher parts. This is the point at which Homo sapiens are coming into Europe this is the time span in which Neanderthals eventually disappear. So there's the potential at this site for telling that story. We're not, as, uh, as, as, as uh, Paleolithic archaeologists, um, really hung up on Neanderthal disappearance. We never were, even before, even before the genetic evidence came through, because we think it's far more important to really establish the 400,000 years in which Neanderthals were, were surviving, were adapting, were developing. Um, because only if you can understand that long time span, can you really frame what might have been different in the last 20,000 years in which they disappeared? So it's really exciting finding that we had a sequence here that could deal with that. We also had a legacy um, in the form of 100,000 artifacts that were excavated by Professor Charles McBurney from the site, from older deposits, deposits that date between 125,000 years ago and 255,000 years ago. And these have been stored away in Jersey and unlooked at for, for 35 years. That was because there was no data to go with them um, very easily, but we managed to work with the Cambridge Computing Department to get some data off magnetic tape um, get it into an early version of SPSS, work it up eventually into Excel and then into GIS down here. That little animation is showing you the position of 100,000 artifacts and 4,000 pieces of bone, largely megafaunal bone, woolly rhinoceros, woolly rhino. And we started working on analysing these tools because the most exciting thing for me as an archaeologist is that the Carte de Saint-Vallard is one of a series of sites in the world, a small number of sites that shows long term repeated habit habitation. And if I put this together with the work that I do on sites like Boxgrove, that are much older, that are half a million years old or, or, or thereabouts, which are all open air, where the butchered animal bone and the stone tools are found on riversides and lakesides, which are you know areas where animals are being hunted, animals are being butchered, food is being shared and consumed. Well, that's all you get for the lower Paleolithic at that point in time. Um, sometimes you get stuff captured in a in a cave because it's been washed in. But people aren't living in caves. In fact, you can't see where people are living at all. But at a site like Lacotte, we might choose sites like Arago or Kezem Cave or in Africa, Wonderwork Cave or Cave of Hearts. These are sites where people are actually living and they have structured use of space. They have fireplaces. They have processing activities going on. They have sleeping areas. These are sites in which people are living. These are sites in which we can discuss the term later. These are sites which effectively provide a home for um, a, a, a Neanderthal group and a Neanderthal population, almost certainly seasonally, almost certainly periodically. But we have a sequence here that, as I said, spans, you know, over a hundred.
self by having to leave, but then they come back and we can see what they do. So it becomes a series of repeated experiments, if you like, seeing repeated reoccupation of the same bit of landscape. What do they do different this time? And we can think about how closely related in genetic terms they might be to the people who've come before. That's something we're never going to really get at because we haven't got fossil evidence for all of these different layers. But then you can look at their tool forms, you can look at the range of tools that they're using, and you can think about how culturally they might be um, related to each other. And there's certainly aspects of the archaeology of the way tools are made, the way tools are used, that are pretty unique to Lacotte. And yet we see them repeatedly over 100,000 years. And that one of our biggest challenges is working out to what degree is that a, a culturally distinctive population with a way of doing something that's maintained in a macro region over an infeasibly long period of time, or to what degree is the logic of the place? The logic of the place combined with a cultural repertoire playing out in the same way and ending up with the same products. There's no answer on that yet, but it certainly gets to the core of um, trying to understand cultural processes. And now there's enough understanding of variation of Neanderthal tool forms and how they map um, geographically, some amazing work by Karen Rubens on Neanderthal um, hand axe form um, across across Europe, the, the large bifacial butchery knives that so maps onto regional areas. There's no functional reason why these tools um, should look different. Um, they all perform the same function. They just have regional repertoires. And it's inescapable that what you have there are Neanderthal cultural groupings. So I find it exciting to think, well, you know, if they're making tools in this particular way, they're dressing in a particular way, they're talking in a particular way as well. So, you know, I think uh, 30 years ago, the idea of kind of mapping, uh, mapping cultural regions of Neanderthal groups um, was unthinkable, but we're starting to get there. The other thing we've been able to do at Lacan is rethink about Neanderthal um, hunting strategies um, at the site. Um, and one of the things that really captured the public imagination and the academic imagination in the 1970s and the 1980s were two large heaps of, of mapped animal bone, um, largely woolly mammoth and woolly rhinoceros that have been found at two separate levels. Well, we've gone back, we've looked at these levels, we've reanalyzed it. We've gone back to Kate Scott's original um, interpretation of the site as being a site at which Neanderthals were working together culturally uh, as, as a group repeatedly at the site as part of their repertoire of, of hunting to drive the mammoth off the cliffs to their death in the ravine below. Um, and this was, re you know, this is part of that same reconstruction drawing I showed you from the late 1970s, that moment when there was an awareness that Neanderthals would be capable of modern human behavior. Um, and this was this was exciting. It was cooperative behavior, working together. Um, it might have been overkill in terms of what the Neanderthal group needed in terms of meat, but they were securing their own future by this group behavior that could even involve the whole the whole group. Well, our work um, came up with an alternate hypothesis that, in fact, the ravine system wasn't suited to game drives, but by mapping the sea floor immediately in front of, of, the, of the cave, we, we, we worked out it was a very highly structured landscape out there of ravines and gullies that were 10 to 20 meter wide, kind of in this New York grid pattern of, uh, of streets and avenues, um, an area that's perfect for ambush hunting. And looking at the fauna showing that the bone was actually coming in on multiple occasions and these bit heaps of bone which you can see mapped out here weren't just piles of refuse there were structural things in these um in these piles of bone that mammoth skulls were placed in particular ways so their so their tusks were the pointed up ribs were laid alongside the skulls to kind of anchor the skulls in place in one case a rib was driven through a skull to 
um, stop the skull kind of moving around, you know, it's actually bashed through to anchor it into the ground. Um, scapula, there's big shoulder blades of mammoth, were piled on top of each other like a, a pile of plates balanced um, amidst tusks. None of these things have like, you know, a meaning that we can readily um, decode and we're, we're not over interpreting them either. But whatever they are, they are purposely created. They're entered into in a, in a, in a very structured and ordered way. And they're happening on more than one occasion, separated by thousands of years. So again, they sit within this meta cultural repertoire of, 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 of the Neanderthal population there. Um, and um, myself and Clive Gamble have uh, drawn on the term bricolage to describe them as these kind of, uh, you know, projects of, uh, you know, independent kind of creativity um, uh, that not, not necessarily working to any blueprint or any, any, any kind of template but creating something quite spontaneously that has meaning by dint of just how structured and ordered it is. Um, and the idea that you could have gone into the, um, the cave at one point um, and seen the areas of, of habitation, seen the areas of, of burning and feeding, but then at the back, it's framed by this incredible kind of sculpture of, of tusks and skulls anchored in place. Um, you know, it's really striking. There's something monumental about what they were they were creating. Um, and we can now see from sites like Brunacal Cave, we can now see from uh, um, where you have these great big circles of stalagmites from, from the way in which Neanderthals are buried in particular sites in, in a very ordered way, that Neanderthals were capable, Neanderthal populations were capable of entering into quite spectacular monumentality. And my challenge is, you know, this is not behavior that we're seeing right at the end of the, the Neanderthal time on the planet where there might be possible interaction with Homo sapiens. These are taking place 150, 170,000 years ago when the only population in Northwest Europe are, ne are Neanderthal people. Um, and then to look what's happening elsewhere. Um, you know, where, where are the, where are early Homo sapiens structures? You know, it, you, know it, you can actually start to look at a checklist of kind of innovations within Neanderthal Europe. And most of the time they are keeping pace with, they are matching um, innovations that you're finding um, within Africa, within other parts of, of the old world. Um, and in sometimes you're getting, you know, unique things like a lot of burials and these strange uh, expressions of monumentality. So, um, I want to leave a bit of time for, for, for discussion, but um, here's, here's a reconstruction drawing we had done a couple of years ago of, of the Neanderthal group um, uh, erecting or, 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 or setting in place some of these skulls at the back of the, the Lecoq cave um, and entered into, into a volume that we produced called Crossing the Threshold, which looked at this point in time in which different human populations, including Neanderthal populations, were changing the way they lived and the way that they configured their lives in relation to space and started to adapt, change, modify um, particular parts of the landscape that were already affordances like rock shelters, overhangs, cave entrances, and some cases even deeper into the cave, into the dark zone where you need fire, and bringing fire and materials there to, um, to create a new niche, to create um, a, a, a new adaptation, which is you know, the, the hominin home, um, one of the building blocks really of, of human adaptation anywhere on the planet and a key innovation that you can see in some ways as clearly, maybe in some cases far more clearly in Neanderthal populations than you can in other populations. So if, uh, if it's okay um, and stop that there, we can, we can have a discussion and I can, I can maybe hop to some other slides later on if anything comes up. How does that sound? Fantastic. Marvellous.
could you just say a little bit more um, about that um, amazing sort of um, almost arrangement of mammoth, mammoth tusks, tusks at the back of the Lakot cave? I mean, were they, how, how sort of precarious were they? How solid were they? Does it look as if they were put there for decorative purposes or just to sort of store them? Could it just say a bit more? It's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so first of all, you know, the reason that Kate Scott thought that this um, was probably a game drive is that if the feeling, if, if you have large skulls, we'll get onto the side of them later on, you have skulls with tusks in. It, this is usually the sort of stuff that stays put at the place where the animal died. You know, it haven't got a lot of meat on them. Um, so, you know, you, you might transplant away limb elements, you might take blocks like shoulder blades back to somewhere where you're going to redistribute food. You know, skulls will stay at the point that they died. So to have like 23, um, you know, skull elements at this cave site suggested that there were a lot of dead bodies there at, at one point in time. But it wasn't until you know we 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 looked we looked at it in detail. You saw that there was lots of different weathering conditions. These were coming in, not in a single um, episode. They're coming in lots of different times. So why are they bringing these large elements in? Well, first thing to say is they're not that large. In fact, these 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 mammoths are actually quite small relatively. They're small for woolly mammoth. Um, we're on a point of. Uh, uh, Kate Scott, who we still, you know, we're, we're working with, is, is publishing on a, a new species identification, but they're actually quite small. They stand about 1.5 to 1.7 meters at the shoulder. So these, these skulls are probably maneuverable if weathered already by a couple of people, maybe even one person. Um, so maybe they're being brought in, um, partially butchered, Maybe it's uh, residual, uh, there's residual meat on them. They're not being um, smashed open in every case to get a, a, the brain. Um, maybe the bone itself is a resource as well. There's, they're not burnt wood at this site because there's very little wood in the landscape during this, during this period. Anyway, during the period of the, the, um, the, the, uh, the bone heaps. So they could be making some stockpiles of bone for burning. But if they are stockpiles, and it, or if they are refuse heaps from just removing marginal bits of meat and scavenging out tongues and things like things that might be left behind, then they are refuse heaps that are built in a remarkably structured way. And I don't think we need to think about an either or an or here. You know, I think you can have something that is effectively waste material being placed orderly out of the way of your normal habitation, out of the way of your normal movement. But in the course of doing that, you're working together as a group. You understand some, some kind of, I don't know, rules of how, how you do this, because you've probably done this at other sites before. You've done this all your life. And what you leave behind is not something chaotic, a, a, a trash heap. What you leave behind is something that's quite structured and has the capacity to have meaning, even though we'll never be able to access that. Um, and I think if nothing else, if you're a mobile population and you're using these affordances at different times of the year, um, leaving behind something that's, you know, so definite, so unchaotic, so obviously um, an artifact is a really good way of actually curing in that in that place, in that affordance, the idea that people made this, the people used it, the people, people are present um, there. So that's where we bring in the word monumentality um, because it's even just by itself, it carries meaning of, the, of, of presence, of habitation, of, of deliberate engagement. Have you evidence of how close to, like just in meters, to those arrangements of tusks, the people that were habitation areas or maybe fire. I mean, have you any evidence for that? Yeah, right, right, right next door. Yeah. So there's um so immediate the the space there's only about sort of five meters, five meters across by ten meters. So it's quite a narrow cave. So that, um and so that yeah. tear cover was quite quite accurate. I mean the the, the, the like how to decorate your home is, isn't too far fetched. I mean it's 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one one thing that is really um, striking about these bone heaps, and there's there's three, two of them, two of them well recorded, one of them wasn't very well preserved or recorded, is they both appear just before a long period of abandonment. So these are being um, these are being produced by Neanderthal populations that may be under a degree of pressure as well. Because in the subsequent stratigraphic units, in both, in all three cases, we get complete abandonment. In the points at which the cave is being used intensively and repeatedly, um, you do get a bit of ordering of where the bones, bones are stacked, but nothing, nothing nearly so monumental. So maybe something is going on there. Maybe there is a, a reaction to stress. Maybe there is a need to invest um, in these in these places just a little bit more. We don't know yet. Is it? I mean, I'm, I mean, coming from not, not, very, not very knowledgeable about this, but I remember in in, in, in Rufignac in France, just thinking that those that extraordinary cave of, of images of mammoths was produced mm. just as the mammoths were becoming extinct. So mm. you're suggesting that just as the mammoths were disappearing, they were particularly treasuring the, whatever they've got left of mammoths. I mean, obviously that's a bit over-interpreting, I'm sure, but... <laughs> but uh... No, it's, it's different, Gritz. No, what I'm saying is this is just before the Neanderthal population yeah. has to leave there. So, yeah. um, oh, so it's, it's possible that the mammoth could have continued, although it is also possible that the, the, the mammoth did have to move as well. But in the, in the overlying strata, in both cases, temperatures get so cold that the only things you're seeing are lemming and hair. And, you, and uh, you, know, but, you know, the mammoth might still be there. So it's happening just before um, big, profound changes. But it's undoubted that there are places where, you know, mammoth are going, are going extinct. And that may well be down to overhunting in some parts of Europe. Questions? Camilla, you must have a lot to say. Ian Watts is here, I'm pleased to say. Hello, Ian. Hi. Okay. <laughs> just time too late. You've just missed a very <laughs> interesting lecture from, from, from Matt plus his, plus his cat. His cat was entered, was um, contributing to very <laughs> interesting accompaniments, musical accompaniment. There's three of them here. Oh, three of them, yeah. Uh, there's a whole orchestra. Yeah. So well, no, no I, I was just really interested in the um, that overview, the images overview, and especially you saying because I, I too started at just about that time of mitochondrial leave, and um, and it was like it just uh, wiped down to ground zero that suddenly the Neanderthals were nothing. They they had no Paul Mellons wouldn't allow any language. They had no creativity. They were just too uh, just not up to it, up to snuff. And it took a long time. It just took a long time. And and really, it's because of the realization that we've shared genes and we've got uh, 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 shared lineages. Um, that that has absolutely changed now to mm -hmm. the point where it sounds that when you're talking as though it's just kind of commonly accepted that Neanderthals had symbolic culture. It's like kind of uh, assumed virtually as, as that's the likelihood. And people like uh, Gilau, um, as well as Denico, but, but Jean Gilau were so um, staunch in re retaining faith in Neanderthals, we could say. Yeah, yeah, and they were, <coughs> they've been vindicated. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, completely. No, I think, it, I think it was very confusing. It was very, I think it was genuine. Mitochondrial Eve as a paradigm presented such a challenge. I think we'll look back at it as a, as a crisis of confidence, you know. You know and, and, and this is where, and, 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 and stopping to, stopping to trust what people were seeing in the archaeological record. Yeah. Um, mm. The archaeological record was being reinterpreted because then there needed to be this difference, this, this break mm. between the two populations. Mm. It was a kind of scientism, wasn't it? A kind of thing, oh, genetics is real science and everything else is interpretation. Right. Yeah. Can I come in here? Yeah. yeah, go on in. 
Yeah, it's, it's two. One, 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 two points. One, one's a question. I just came in, as, as you pointed out, right at the very end. Um, but I, I heard you say that they weren't even smashing open the crania to get the brains. Not in, not in every case. No, some were, but some were, some were intact, completely intact. That's, so, that's, you know, that's a brilliant food source and we see it happening again and again. So why is it? Is it, as Kate Scott would have said, that there's such an abundance of, you know, meat that you don't need to go for these more marginal, I don't think they are marginal, but that could be a perception, these more marginal areas, or um, is it that these are coming in effectively as weathered, rotted skulls from the, the surrounding landscape? Um, yeah, just on, on, on that, it's, I mean, you, you'd never consider, I mean, I don't think any hunter-gatherer would consider the brain marginal food. No. I, I mean, it's no, it's not at all. DHA for a start, you know, no. sort of essential amino acids. The, the, the other point, more in terms of, pers you know, perspectives on what things were like 30 years ago, was that, of course, it wasn't, it wasn't, yes, the DNA came along, but then fairly shortly afterwards, um, We've we've seen the slow accretion of, of of evidence, mostly from people like Gilao and Derrico, but also with 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 with, uh, with the birds' feathers and so on. So so it was coming at it from coming at the problem from you know the, 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 it was a second front that was opening up. It wasn't just um, you know you couldn't just defend a sort of genes pro takes priority mm. o o over any other discipline. It was, it was that the archeology span was changing very rapidly from, from the late nineties onwards in terms of what Neanderthals were doing, particularly late Neanderthals were doing. Mm. Yeah, but I, but I think that momentum, well, you know, I, I didn't, didn't experience it, but looking, looking at the literature, that momentum, Seem to be there in the sixties and seventies, to a degree. Yeah, but then, um, yeah. It's, 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 and, sorry. And then, and then was, and then was, I think, quite heavily derailed, or at least entered a, a period of stagnation in the, in the nineties, because I felt people were looking to try and find those reasons that explained the the disappearance, explained yeah. when 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 the Antile populations didn't didn't measure measure up. I think yeah. what's exciting now is actually trying to look at those uh, modern human populations that are first first making it into the, the Near East and now with with um, Baku Kiro making it into um, into Europe and you know, how there is now just a, you know, no difference in terms of material culture that is tangible and meaningful between what's coming in in those early waves. The origination is a long way behind that first wave of, of contacts. Um, and the origination and everything that comes after it is, if there is assimilation, is after assimilation in, in most areas. Um, you know, the, the, the massive proliferation of art in Europe is happening, you know, after assimilation. It's not there um, with, with, the, with the first modern humans, as far as we can tell, coming into, coming into Europe. So that's an, that's an exciting new area, new new front that, that I'm excited about. Did you um, did you catch up, Matt, with um, Camilla's and Ian's and Volker's um, seasonality thermostat model for the peri periodicity of Neanderthal symbolic cultural um, expressions? And, no, I haven't. No, talk talk me through it. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> Better ask Kibera to sort of say a little bit. I mean, it's not. This is probably not the place for that. I mean, we're asking you questions, but. Um, okay. but I, mean, no, I mean, we, you know, created, yeah. um, but it was about trying to look at um, the similarity or difference of the pigment record. So we were trying to track through um, the evidence in Europe of pigment, um, and then say, because according to the models that we we, we use. Uh, with the idea that encephalization stress on on females is what's driving symbolic strategies, then 
presumably Neanderthals had similar levels of stress. They would have had the same kinds of reproductive, um, it, it, the, the whole reproductive energetics, at least, if not more than modern humans. Um, so we were trying to make comparisons on that. And we had an idea about um, uh, seasonality, very extreme seasonality for Neanderthals during Ice Age. Um, and we've got to be careful because, as you say, we can't just talk about the Neanderthals on that. You've mm -hmm. got to look at specific populations. Um, but because of very strong seasonality in um, yeah, I, glacial stages, that would lead to a situation of quite strong reproduct, we said birth seasonality. So it's not an unreasonable argument to say Neanderthal women had um, significant birth seasonality, particularly in glaciations. We've got that example of the teeth from Rhone Valley um, a pear site, yeah. Tanya Smith, where they're showing the um, birth of an offspring in spring and weaning in autumn. Uh, which would then be presumably the mother then being um, pregnant for the next year. Um, so what that does, the, the synchrony, that seasonality, is it kind of keeps the males much more better behaved in terms of um, they're just kind of, if, if women are in sync, then it's harder for males to kind of move from one woman to another is the yeah. argument. Um, so we're, we're using the reproductive synchrony models and saying, well, that would imply during Ice Age when that synchrony was in place, Neanderthals wouldn't have needed uh, ritual strategies, but then we would see ritual strategies perhaps arising when the climate improved and seasonality was lost, if it was lost. Yeah. And that was the argument. So we tried to fit um, what we could of the pigment record onto that. How would it, how would it work if they were becoming increasingly um, proficient at like buffering themselves from the effects of seasonality as well, you know, in terms of, you know, use of fire? Yeah, when they, when they were, they had abundance and were um, able to, um, bit, so have fertility like coming up through the year, mm. then you would, you would expect that that leads to more sexual conflict because males will um, may have mated with one partner in an early part of the year and if once she's pregnant they may be looking for another partner later part of the year so you would then expect ritual strategies to arise yeah yeah it would be logical yeah so if you think that there is evidence for big seasons of abundance that that also might uh, underlie ritual strategies so so the argument is that the neanderthal the, the kind of ratchet effect for the neanderthals it wasn't, yeah. wasn't wasn't so continuous. There was there were in a sense with um, with each glacial the, the, the Neanderthals kind of didn't need, didn't didn't need yeah. the symbol the, the ochre strategies the symbolic but it, uh, but, mm. and then they sort of had to reinvent the wheel again. Whereas in Africa there was a much more continuous accumulation of those more, continuous, more continuous kind of curve, yeah. but. Um, Matt's mentioned Brunichel, uh, which is kind of coming up right in the, the beginnings, although in a kind of warmish bit of MIS-6, as far as I remember. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, Brunichel is just so mysterious and amazing, and you just wonder what the hell, you know, this is. But it doesn't, it definitely is showing some kind of ritualistic, I mean, it's almost like the Van der uh, situation, Brunichel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Wonderworks, yeah. it's, you know, quite chronologically out there. I still can't quite, uh, yeah. can't, quite can't quite accommodate it, but it's, it's fine. Brunicow, I think the exciting thing about Brunicow is um, that um, it, it occurs in this really durable material, stalagmite, um, in a place that nothing's ever going to touch it, mm. nothing's ever going to um, disturb it or affect it because it's in a completely stable, deep cave. 300 meters in mm. in the dark zone you know no animals are going to disturb it no other humans are going to find it so you know Brunicau is something in itself but it makes you wonder you know what sat out there in landscapes temporary arrangements of bone of wood or organic material you know what 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 are we missing um not yeah. far from um uh, not far from Brunicau in uh La Foley um you know, a Neanderthal wooden circle 
has, has been discovered, a series of wooden posts that doesn't make any sense as a, sh as a shelter. It's too big um, to be a shelter, but uh, could be a windbreak or it could just be a mm. thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you know, Brun Brunicau are three, three stone circles. There's no other way to describe them. They're three stone circles. Mm -hmm. Could you yeah. describe it for the rest of us here? Could you describe it a bit more detail mm -hmm. for us? Yeah, so it's a site that was only discovered about, um, well, published six years ago. Um, it sits 300 meters in, in the dark zone of a cave. It's a cave where you would have to take fire in, either as a, you know, either as, you know, a burning burning brand or a, or a, or a lamp or, or something. There are, there are fires and hearths within there. But um, the, the cave itself at that point had um, both stalagmites and stalactites. Um, and these were smashed off by um, what we presume is a, is a Neanderthal population um, and then rearranged into um, three irregular circles. Um, and not just piled, you know, not just piled up, but you know, some stalagmites were, you know, put up and, and others were stacked on top of each other to create like a, you know, like a tiny little wall of stalagmites. It's very similar to what we're seeing with the bones at Lecoq, you know, structural, structural placing and a bit of buttressing. Um, and there's not feeding carrying on in there as far as we can know. They're not making stone tools in there. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a long way in the cave. As I said, it's dark. Um, and yeah, then, and just where, where exactly, and when exactly? I think it's a. I think it's a. The date is around one hundred and seventy thousand um, years ago, I think. Yes, and it's it's in south central France. Can I just query, just ask what what your problems with Vanderwerk were? Ah. Oh. Controlled use of fire at 1.2 million years. You know, it's 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 it, it's a bit of an outlier. Um, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, in terms of in terms of time and fire, you know, that, it, that particular is population. Two million now. Uh, mm. Pardon? Is it two million controlled use? Well, no, it's one million the fire. No, you yeah? said you said one, one point two. What? Yeah, I think one. I think one works one point two. Yeah, um, right. and you know, there's, there's claims of fire at, 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 at older, but this is a site where you've got repeated, real, repeated real combustion fire. going on. It's just a bit of an outlier. You know, you- But it's, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, it, it is. Uh, but it is right at the front of the cave. Mm. And it's, it's not such an outlier if once we take into account places like um, uh, Gesher, Gesher Benoit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where the Geshe's what, 750,000, still like, you know, over mm -hmm. half a million um, years. And I, I, I accept that, you know, you can, you can probably have completely self contained arcs of innovation um, and, uh, and potentially loss, you know, of, 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 of technology and, and innovations. But once you get to 500,000 years, it's so prevalent and, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's so so widespread, and you get this you get this complete loss of complete butchery sites out in the open landscape. You get things that are clearly um, primary butchery sites, but then you also get that cave record of, of secondary butchery that's you know really yeah really quite ordered. So yeah, it's not so much that I I, I, I disbelieve it. It's just that I. I almost need to try and create an accommodation for it as a self-contained, as a self-contained occurrence of quite an innovative but behavior. I, but I mean, I think I think it may it, it may be still consistent with what you're saying because it's not until at, we think about five hundred thousand that you're seeing use at the back of the cave hmm. um, that required firelight. Um, you know, that's when we find the pigments at the back. Um, so so the, I think there is still a qualitative difference and they're not using that as a campsite. Um, yeah. That whatever's, you know, the, that seems to be special activities. Um, so, so, yeah, I think we, we're left up in the air about what these early occurrences are telling us or, or but they don't seem to be stabilizing or generalizing. Yeah. 
can, yeah. Matt, can I can I provoke you on fire? Um, so yeah. because just because you're here and I'm I've got and we've have in in among ourselves here we've had arguments about all this. So your response to Richard Wrangham's idea that that you had to have pretty reliable um, cooked food in order for all kinds of things to happen. And so I mean, basically, Wrangham saying that Erectus must have been already um, able to rely on cooked food. And of course, there's absolutely no archaeological evidence for that. And then if you so, but the but of course you've got other completely different arguments about sort of nu nutritional value of raw and uncooked foods and all the rest of it. So I've I've just been having a um, discussions with Jerome Lewis here. Uh, who's done this, this like 20 years field work with the Benjeli forest people. And he says, Chris, the, the archaeologists are completely up the creek because <laughs> in, the, in the area where he works, you, the, the, there's, firstly, there's no stones. The fire is carried around by women in fire resistant leaves. There's a special kind of leaf where you just, you, you, can, you can wrap up the embers, carry them from place to place. It can be an absolute torrent of rainfall and the fire, fire will still be you know, alive for days on end, days on end. And uh, archaeologists would see nothing of it. Um, and so they, of course, conclude that the Benjeli didn't have fire, whereas actually they have, a, you know, they don't, they don't kindle it, they don't need it. That, it. The women never ask for matches, for example, only the men do that because the women have always got this fire with them. Yeah. And if you rely on archaeological evidence, you'd say that the Boxgrove people didn't have fire because as I think you kind of mentioned earlier on, there's absolutely no archaeological evidence for fire at Boxgrove, which is ridiculous. If, if you infer from that, that they didn't have fire, they must obviously have had fire. So I don't know. Just um, I'm just. Well, uh, yeah, I I am. Do you agree, do you agree I'm, with I'm, I'm, Do you agree with <laughs> Richard Rangan? Because Richard Rangan has now got support from Kristen Hawkes uh, on the behavioural ecology side, and also from John Gowlett, who who's, who admits that there's no archaeological evidence, but thinks that Rangan's got a very powerful argument. And I tend to think that Rangan has a powerful argument. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I certainly wouldn't dismiss Rangan's argument, but I guess um, and. I'm absolutely open to the idea that we are missing huge amounts in, in the archaeological record. Mm. But when people are habitually using fire, you know, we don't seem to miss it at all. There's always burnt artifacts. There's mm. always burnt bone. Um, mm. There's always the combusted material. And it's just not there at all in the, in the European. Um, I can't speak about the African record, but it's not there in the European lower paleolithic it's not there until 400,000 400,000 years ago mm. if we were arguing over what some small traces of charcoal meant you know were these artifacts from a wildfire were they from a controlled burn similarly with you know, a few scraps of bone that were charred if we were arguing over very marginal evidence um then we'd have to really create a big conceptual space that the lower paleolithic in europe contained fire but it's just not there so i find it very hard to i'm uh, very hard to entertain you know the strongly that it was there before four hundred thousand, without a, you know, even a tiny bit of evidence for it one thing i think we are over overlooking is the degree to which stone tools are used to process food in different ways um that um you know as, as you know ian was saying you know the, the brain you know, tongue, um, gut contents, uh, offal, these aren't marginal. These are probably the things that are being targeted um, if you are going to be processing um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, meat as, as we understand it. Then you probably do need fire to get the best out of it, to, to, to break it down. But there's other things you can do. You know, what, what, are, what are hammer stones being used for? We don't know enough about what processing tools like scrapers and small knives are, are, are being used for. Things that can actually, you know, pre-digest not, um, not through combustion, but through, you know, pre-maceration and, and processing. So I think there's other avenues to be explored as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do we have any other questions from, it's been a bit, between the four of us up here, or five of us. Yeah. I got ten minutes, and then I got to go. Got so. Ten minutes. Come on, everybody. Oh, that's fine. Great. Come on. Well, if, if no one else is coming in right now, <laughs> God. Uh, just backing up, Matt, on that. I, th I think. Oh, 
where, where Rangham is, 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 has, has the point is the maceration of food. Yeah. You know, I, I think he, I can't remember the details, but I think he showed some details, uh, some, some data on the energetics or the energetic benefit, the caloric benefit of when you just finally chop the food. <clears throat> and it's almost as much as when you start cooking it. And, 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 and so why do you need fire at two million years ago? I, I mean, what, what from, from at least 1.8 or something, you, 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 you're finally chopping it. Well, the reason is because in Africa, you'd have had the fire the whole time. I mean, savannah chimps have fire, they make use of it. I mean, and all you've got to do is know how to not let it go out and the, and the uh, fire resistant leaves. Is yeah, but, but, but Chris, Matt, Matt address that point. It would still, if they were doing that habitually, you'd still be finding burnt bone. I don't, well. And you don't. Well, I mean, Jerome just says he wouldn't find anything. In, I mean, I know I that's probably- would. If you started doing archeology span of the Congo, which hasn't been done or scarcely, you know, until, you know, they're just, you know, that's another matter. But like, um, if you find any bone, you're looking for burnt bone and you don't find it in, in the lower Paleolithic. As far as I'm aware, like, but yeah, we would, we would, we would, we would see it. We'd argue over what it meant, and I'm sure there'd still be a camp that would deny that it was, it was bone. But we would see it, and it would be really, it'd be really distinctive because it is when it's there. It's, you... it's inescapable. But what you do get is, and you know, we, we're crossing back now from Lacotte and 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 Neanderthal to maybe early Neanderthal Hydrobagensis, and thinking about sites like. Um, sites like Foxgrove, what, what you do get is huge amounts of smashing open of bone, systematic destruction of carcasses into its tiniest, tiniest elements. And I'm really, I'm really struck by just how, um, how transformative and systematic it is. And the one thing that we managed to, to show there with the Boxgrove um, uh, butchery is that you've got like these large hand axes there and there's only eight or nine of them being used, these big primary um, butchery knives. But all of the pieces of debitage, all of the little waste flakes are being picked up by other people and they're all engaging in, you know, using tiny little flakes against big blocks. Of meat. And I'm sure it's just like breaking everything down, you know, into, into everything, sucking out every bit of fat from the, spongy trabecular bone. Um, the horse fat is really liquid. So they're breaking it down just to suck out the fat from it. So, yeah. you know, the, I, the, it's like when you, when, when you finally come across the, into, into um, sites where fire is being used habitually and, and you just end up with entire deposits, you know, tens of centimeters thick that is just burnt bone. You know, that's, that's that's because you've got some residential stability. But if the hunter gatherers who are moving around are just lighting a fire wherever they happen to be, which is what sort of what Jerome's talking about, you move quite frequently every few weeks, and, you, and there's no structured hearth. So you just light the fire, uh, and it's you know bits of wood and stuff. And um, well, oh, well, there there is a possibility there that I'll concede in in the lower Paleolithic, yeah. which is that all of these sites that we we're, we're finding are stone artifacts and smashed up bone, okay? That's all you find. Now, wherever these hominins are sleeping, wherever they're um, putting their stick, wherever they're giving birth, wherever yeah, they're, you know, it isn't around these, you know, butchered carcasses out in the open. Yeah. These are places where butchery and feeding maybe is taking place but there's another dimension there's another there's another whole world out there where they're sleeping where they're nesting where they're settling where they're sheltering um but those places must if they exist they must be devoid of food waste and they must be devoid of any identical artifacts um you know those places could have potentially fire in them but if you haven't got burnt bone and you haven't got stone artifacts then yeah we, we wouldn't find it Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to keep an open mind. Um, Car so they're not. Carlos. They're not having fires at the butchery sites. Yeah. Sorry, Camilla. Car Carlos has got his hand up. Go on, Carlos. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, Carlos. Yeah. 
Go for it. Carlos, you've got to un oh. oh, sorry. Yeah. You wanna Carlos? You, all right? you got your hand up. No. Oh well. Oh, maybe it's Max. No. No, all right. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, Matt's got to go in two minutes. I, I was just going to put in, if nobody else has a question, um, Carlos, the, not Carlos, sorry, Matt, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the recent paper, uh, the Bendel Barkai elephant hunting, Homer Ectus, the big elephant hunter, and we kind of come downhill after that with less and less meat. Um, what do you think of that from your perspective as a, as a mammoth? experts and archaeologists what do you think of all that yeah i yeah i mean i i love i love the stuff ran the the the, the amount of incredible data ran is managing to fill out of uh, you know especially kez mk um yeah you know i think yeah. what they have there is a story that works for what we see in the near east and there's no doubt that after the loss of the large elephants in the near east you see an entire sort of repositioning of but again, it's it's part of the fact that it's sitting in somewhere that isn't subject to quite such those those big biotidal resets. Um, rather right. like you were saying about Africa, there's a trajectory there. And part of that trajectory in that area involves the loss of the megafauna and we see okay. a repositioning on the the thing that happens in, in Europe is you get these big resets. And so the megafauna keep on coming back. Even exactly. what we need to try and work out is were there more localized short term extinction events? And you know, one thing we, we you know we're looking at mm -hmm. is you know, why you know, reduction in body size and things like that. So it's just mm -hmm. you get a reset in northern Europe, and do those resets correspond to the season mm -hmm. seasonality thermostat uh, intervals that? Camilla and Ian are talking about. Are they roughly? That'd be interesting like to look at. Yeah. 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 Well, perhaps. I mean. Yeah. It's, it's in paleoanthropology, <laughs> 2014. Is it, it um, Camilla? Is it that? It, yeah. I, will see, I will seek it out. And, and 2013. 2013. Yeah. 2013. We can send the link here. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, Camilla, do you want to close the meeting? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not, not going to be a huge ceremony here. We won't need <laughs> monuments. Um, Carlos is, is trying to ask, um, oh, it, it was kind of what uh, Carlos is trying to ask about the, the mammoth skulls again, uh, if it's uh, evidence of sustained ritual practice. But I think Matt would pre maybe find that a, a big overinterpretation. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're leaving that very open. Um, very contingent, uh, yeah. um, um, ritualized practice. Yeah. Ritualized, yes, of some kind. Oh. I, I, I have a very big open mind on, on the likelihood of Neanderthal ritualized practice, I, I think. I think it's almost impossible nowadays to deny that that at least several Neanderthal populations were fully symbolic and linguistic. It's impossible yeah, to deny. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think the big question is, you know, if thinking about their demographics, if they were living in relatively self-contained, relatively isolated um, groups, they may well have ritualized behavior. But is there any need for you know, a symbolic framework and network that that goes beyond their their, their tiny population. I don't know. You know, it's um, it's yeah. it. Yeah, that's a key question. Absolutely key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think we should thank Definitely. Matt for the. Uh, I mean, okay. I think we'll let you thank go. Thank you, really. Matt. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, thank Thanks you. for the invitation. Yeah. You yeah. Go. yeah. Thank you. Well, we'll come You're and see welcome. you. Come and see you for real when for real happens again. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Bye, everyone. Yeah, bye bye. Yeah, bye. Thank bye. you. Camilla, do you want to advertise next week? Bye. Bye. Okay. All right. Bye. Uh, sorry. Next week we have um, we have another archaeologist who's particularly focused on hunter gatherers. His archaeology is, is connected with the Mesolithic in Scotland. In fact, um, the Cairngorms. Um, this is Graham Warren from University College Dublin. 
um, and he is currently one of the key organizers of the um, Hunter Gatherer Conference, CHAGS, and the International Society of Hunter Gatherer Research. So he's asking the question of whether there is a distinctive hunter gatherer archaeology. So it's another archaeologist, but he should be really good. Okay, cheers, everybody. Cheers.